Hi, Matthew Clay here. Today I wanted to talk about what's happening with some of the big macro technologies people have been excited about for a while. Think driverless cars to crypto to the metaverse and and and, and on and on. Um, it must feel a bit like they they're all they're all going into a bit of a funk with the interesting and I think perhaps precarious exception of AI. Uh, driverless cars seem harder and further away than people maybe expected a few years ago. Crypto seems to be achieving fewer practical results and a lot more burned small investors than I think we should treat as see as okay. The metaverse has become, I think unfortunately and unfairly, a bit of a punchline. You know, Meta is still putting out ads about its impact, but it all feels uh, quite half-hearted compared to the excitement a year or so ago. Now, look, part of this might just be a natural cycle from hype to disappointment for some of these technologies. Part of it is that firms made lots of aggressive bets in the pandemic that unfortunately are now uh, resulting in contractions in some services. Uh, this might be the case for, for, for very rapid delivery might be a good example there. But I think that also there might be some more fundamental barriers that we've been creating to innovation at the big corporates that have the research and capital budgets to deliver. Do we do really warrant proper attention if, we, if we're going to think about kind of driving tech progress going forward? So I wanted to try and just talk about a few of those. We have a bigger picture video um, about why are we, why are some of these technologies maybe not delivering at the pace we expected? And is there a role that public policy is taking that we should be giving some attention? So first, I think often people underestimate how hard it can be to build things particularly in mature economies like the UK, and frankly, particularly in the UK. So just to give a couple of examples, it typically takes seven years to get a grid connection. So it's like powering a new industrial site or connecting new energy generation. To install fiber broadband, it takes tens of thousands of street by street permits and approvals for new fiber exchanges that can take multiple, multiple years. And there are other versions of this problem where technology needs to play out through regulated or public sector uh, markets like healthcare and education. I think this has slowed you know, a lot of uh, the promise of the Internet of Things, uh, which again, a, you know, a, a term that's, that, that, that gets talked about a lot less at the moment. Often the incentives cut the wrong way. It's you know, not a lot of upside if you're working in a bureaucratic organization and it does create more work for you. So that means that you tend to see stuttering progress, one pioneering local authority or hospital at a time, lots of really exciting proofs of concept, um, but still a lot of people running on old systems. So these kind of obstacles don't matter for every new technology. Um, and I think that frankly, where we tend to see the fastest progress is where they bind the least, but they will matter some of those that have the most profound social and economic impacts, those where you're transforming the markets that account for an increasing share of um, people's budgets, like healthcare and education, and those which you know, relate to the physical uh, infrastructure that powers their lives. Uh, so I've got an, a, uh, you know, a nuclear fusion uh, um, reactor up there on the screen. So I cringe sometimes when I hear people talk about nuclear fusion as being a source not, not just abundant and clean power, but also cheap power. Um, Fingers crossed, absolutely hope that it, that is the case, uh, you know, even when fusion is ready for deployment. But we just don't know what fusion power plants are going to look like as capital projects. And if we make the process complex enough, we'll make it expensive. I think it's a large part of what's happened to the sufficient nuclear power. And there's no real reason why we can't do that again. It will be one thing to get you know, one very non-trivial challenge to get nuclear ready as a source of power another to get it built, deployed, connected on a large scale. And I think we are getting slower and slower and slower. Uh, and that means more and more cost, because time is money, uh, to deliver this, this stuff. And I think you think that can hold back really exciting tech. Next, second issue I see a lot, and I think this kind of just, just affects all kinds of decisions at a secondary level, is a relative complacency about living standards versus worries about jobs. Most ex recent example here was in the resignation of an AI researcher at Google. One of the risks he cited um, was the risks to employment and labor markets. Now, I've talked about some of the other risks in an earlier video, 
um, on the risks with with what he called what what a, uh, another author called godlike AI. So I won't go over those again here. But I was to talk particularly about jobs because um, it does have a lot of kind of reach and concern in the tech sector and the discourse around tech. So um, there's been a number of kind of prominent figures in the tech scene who've promoted a universal basic income. And this is tends to be premised on the idea that we've got plenty of money. We're going to generate these sort of oceans of wealth and productivity. So we just need it to go around. Um, it, we just need to make up for the fact that it's going to make lots of people. Um, it's going to make generating that wealth so effortless that we just don't need most of the population. I think we just need a reality check about that. In recent decades, we've been doing pretty well on jobs. You know, the, the, the rate from decade to decade in employment actually looks pretty good. Now, look, don't want to be complacent. Whether that will continue to be the case in the future is what we'll see. But compare that to productivity, where productivity growth has been slowing you know, pretty much however you look at it. Um, now, new technologies tend to look pretty good on living standards, but tend to make people nervous on jobs. So if you have this focus on you know, where are the jobs, where are the jobs going to come, come, come from, what are we going to do about employment versus what are we going to do about um, uh, output, uh, driving productivity, driving wages, then it's going to look much more difficult. Uh, and I think that will lead to just a general bias in policy uh, against doing new things, uh, against um, uh, disruption. Uh, and this so it strengthens the ability of vested interests to push back against change. Look at how uh, the kind of negative trends in trade policy globally and particularly in the United States. And I think a part of that is people taking for granted with technologies like AI the upside and, in, and adding the economic impacts to the balance on risks. When I think of you know a more realistic you know way of thinking about AI is that it, the economic impacts will generally be extremely positive, uh, and that you and you, it's thinking about some of the you know maybe social uh, risks that come with it in the same way as we we've we've seen with earlier technologies like social media. The third area I wanted to talk about, and this is maybe the biggest, is I think there's a growing risk reward problem for the bigger tech companies, which matters because so much technical talent and potential to invest in big projects is there. Not to say that's where all the innovations are going to come from. Historically speaking, an awful lot of innovation comes out of smaller, uh, smaller startups, um, uh, you know, high growth gazelles, they're often called, that so, you know, go from being small to large businesses. But these, these big businesses have a role to play, and a lot of them, it's worth remembering, are conglomerates to some extent. They have a large, profitable core business, which they are using to sponsor bets in newer markets, you know, e.g. like a core ads business sponsoring investment in driverless cars or AI or whatever it might be, or the metaverse. Now, I think there's a problem there where regulator power is growing. So the value of corporate reputation grows as well. People are more worried about, create, about risking some kind of backlash that will lead to additional scrutiny over their core business. I think we saw a really explicit version of this with well, what was then Facebook's um, um, experiments in cryptocurrency. It was threats to the core businesses of their, their partners in the, in the financial services, which I think really doomed that effort more than anything. You know, they weren't able to articulate the upside, the, the, sort of the economic uh, benefits very effectively. I think you know they, they they didn't do a good job of telling the story about the potential upside, uh, and they talked the business down too much. Uh, and I think again, it was just all about trying to minimise that risk uh, to the, to uh, through, via public policy to the core business. And so you can think about it as a simple function. What you what businesses are weighing is the value of their core business, the chance how likely a regulatory backlash is and the cost of a regulatory backlash is if it happens. And they've got to weigh that implicitly against the value of the new business, how likely that is to succeed. And these things are always you know, a, um, uh, an uncertain enterprise by their nature and the share of the returns you keep, um, whether that's because of taxes or just because, comp because naturally competition means that consumers get a lot of the benefit. Again, normally the expectation is that most of these benefits will not accrue to the original innovator. It doesn't mean that innovation can't be worthwhile, but it needs outsized returns 
um, because a lot of the benefits will go to others, which is a good thing, right? So right now, the value of those new businesses feels uncertain due to a whole range of facts I won't cover here. And you know, a lot of people feeling burned by some of the big investments made in the pandemic. And the regulatory you know, costs seem large because regulators being empowered by major new digital regulations. That's shifting this balance. It's shifting this balance towards holding back. And in any large business, it's kind of a thousand reasons not to do something new. Um, and I think this is holding back. Um, I think it's one of the reasons driverless car services have been rolling out pretty slowly. Uh, even where they've been, I th from what I can see, looking from the outside, pretty effective where they're being tried. I think it's held, we know it's held back AI releases. So it is affecting the pace at which services can get out there into consumer markets, and then that will affect the timetable for ongoing innovation. And over time, it means we're all poorer. So we need to, I think, be conscious of the, 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 the challenge we're creating here. So just to step back to what this does, what, is, what does this mean? What should we, we take if you, know, you buy my thesis here about why tech might be slowing down? Firstly, for tech companies, I think there's an interesting question about how to keep innovative projects moving forward. You know, again, in any big corporation, there's always a lot of reasons to, to say stop, to say hold back. And normally it's a revenue is the imperative that overcomes those obstacles. And so I think it needs to be, I'm sure there is, but it needs it need, you know, absolutely to be crystal clear on how, what is the substitute that will keep um, that incentive to, to deploy new services, not just to kind of do interesting experiments, but to actually get stuff out there uh, when there is that core business that pays the bills. Uh, they'll need to think about that and also just building compliance right so it's not creating undue obstacles. You know, I think sometimes the kind of uh, patches as you go approach uh, that people can take when there's so many new regulatory requirements coming coming in um, can inadvertently make the aggregate impact on people's ability to innovate higher because they're just having because there's more systems, more obstacles, more holdups. For policymakers, I think they really need to step back and think about priorities. There is just a huge risk that we've made doing new things harder and harder. And those micro frictions combined with the macroeconomic challenges that the world's facing to create a lot more stagnation than we should really be experiencing. And now that while many of those consequences may be long term, uh, I think a shortage of opportunities has short term impacts too. It diminishes incentives to invest at the cutting edge. It means there's just less exciting work going on. Um, and crucially, I think there's rewards for countries that get this relatively right and costs for those. And I think, unfortunately, the UK is bearing some of those at the moment. They get it wrong. Um, and finally, just for entrepreneurs, so just to end on a slightly more positive note, there are always opportunities with these. You know, for all of these obstacles may create aggregate social costs, they will create opportunities. I think we've seen businesses, you know, maybe OpenAI for AI, Tesla for driverless cars that have done well because they've been able to push forward tech that others are holding back. And I think so long as that's done responsibly, um, it's it, that's a good thing, right? Um, but also, if you have innovative ways to deploy these technologies to overcome some of the organizational hurdles, maybe you've got a really clever way to work through the healthcare system or through the education system uh, and get that deployment um, you know, outside of you know, experiments with kind of willing pioneers. Um, as tech in practice falls further and further behind the tech frontier, as those tired systems are more and more in need of a refresh, the benefits to new systems are going to get bigger and bigger. And the case for, 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 for enterprise transformation is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. So I do, do think there will be opportunities here. Uh, and I also and I think that the, 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 that there needs, well, at the same time, as I think there needs to be, that market solution needs to be combined with bigger picture thinking about, are we creating um, a slower uh, underlying rate of technological growth than we should be? So look, I hope you found that interesting. Um, if, you, if, if, you found, if you found it uh, uh, helpful to your own thing, please do like and subscribe uh, a lot more on these kind of topics to come. Uh, and I yeah, look forward to speaking to you next time.